Well, good evening. Uh, it's encouraging seeing you here. I hate to talk to myself, so, um, and I hope you don't mind having a Packer fan in the pulpit, although, even though the Packers played the Bears yesterday, it was the first time probably in my life where I, I just didn't even really care. And uh, that kind of scared me, so I went to the doctor to find out what was going on, and he said it's called maturing. <laughs> he said it's fair, fairly natural, kind of common, he said just keep an eye on it and you should be okay. <laughs> so, but I think the older I get, the uh, less of a big deal that that is. So I'm not here to talk about football, something much more exciting. The central focus is really going to be on the authority of God's Word, that we can trust it from cover to cover and everything that it says. And even though that this is God's first shot at writing a book, I think he did a pretty good job. <laughs> and you can trust everything that's in there. So we're gonna be talking about something called the myth of settled science. Um, there's an organization called the Berean Call out in Oregon. They asked me to speak at their conference. I've been there a number of times, but when they asked me last time, they gave me the topic and they said they wanted it to be on settled science. I said, I, I don't have a talk on settled science. I comment on it during Q&A, but uh, I don't have an entire talk. Well, I do now, <laughs> so I had to put this one together. Uh, but it, it worked really well. I initially had like 680 PowerPoint slides, but I got it down to 672. So, uh, really quickly, for those of you who don't know me, all good things must come to an end. So I'm going to go over, a little bit over my background some more. Um, I was raised in a Christian home, and you can see very clearly that that is a Christian home. And uh, believe the Bible from cover to cover. Went to public schools like many people. When I graduated, I went to a Christian college, John Brown University in Arkansas to study mechanical engineering. I got a degree, but um, then I became more interested in physics. They didn't have a physics major there, so I left there in Arkansas and went back to Wisconsin and went to the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater to get a degree in physics. And that's when my world changed quite a bit, going from that small Christian college where my engineering professors opened up every class in prayer to a large state university where my physics professors did not open up in prayer. Maybe they forgot, I don't know. But um, they were certainly all evolutionists, um, and some of them were atheists, and they were telling me that everything I believed was wrong. And that made me feel very uncomfortable to be surrounded by these PhD scientists who I assumed that they had a lot of evidence for what they believed. I realized for the first time in my entire life that even though I knew what I believed, I did not know why. How did I really know, I mean really know, that God existed? How did I know the creation account was scientifically valid? That's huge studying physics. How did I know there was a worldwide flood? How did I know Jesus was the Son of God? How did I know the Bible is the inspired word of God? I was raised to believe all of those things, and I did believe them. I just couldn't defend them. So God put it on my heart at that point in my life to start looking into things. So I've been looking into things for 37 years. Um, and about 16 years ago, felt called into full-time ministry. Founded a ministry we call the Starting Point Project. Reasoning for the name is everyone, no matter who you are, you have to start somewhere with your belief systems. It's impossible not to start somewhere. Everyone starts somewhere. Christians start with the belief that God exists and the Bible is the Word of God. And then we use that starting point to define everything else. What, what science and logic actually are. History, ethics, morality, philosophy, all those things are defined by our starting point. You can just ask a skeptic, hey, what's your starting point? They probably won't even realize they have one. But if they think through it, they'll say something, and then you can ask them, well, what made you choose that as your starting point? And how or why are you confident that that will help you accurately define everything else around you? And get into these nice conversations. It doesn't have to be combative, but that's why we call our ministry the starting point. Ken mentioned, too, I was invited to be on the board of directors of a group called Logos Research Associates, probably the world's largest group and consortium of scientists who are Christians and creationists. The founding member, Dr. John Sanford, is from Cornell University. He's famous for having invented something called the gene gun. It inserts genes into the DNA. Worldwide famous for that. Was an atheist for many years, but now he's a very strong Christian, very godly man, very humble as well. And there's Dr. John Baumgartner. He's a PhD geophysicist. He just happened to build the world's best 3D computer simulation of plate tectonics. Just off the charts, brilliant. And then there's myself and three other board members. As smart as these guys are, and they're brilliant, if they were here this evening, they'd be the first to admit out of all six board members, I am the tallest. <laughs> it's absolutely true. A couple of weeks ago, we actually had a board meeting through Zoom because we live across the country, and uh, they voted for me to step up and be the new president, which I have lost 
all respect for them now, so <laughs> don't have anything to do with them anymore. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm honored, so I've, I guess technically I'm the president of the group now, but it's an honor to be hanging around guys like these and picking their brain. They're doing cutting edge research. And then I get to translate it into something we call English <laughs> so that everyone else can understand. So back to this talk, the myth of settled science. We've been hearing that phrase now for a number of years, more than ever, the science is settled. And that's what we're gonna be focusing on in this particular talk. And this is going to be you because there's so much to cover. I usually say that James 1.19 says be slow to speak, but it doesn't say speak slow, so I go fast. <laughs> and I'm not here to teach you a lot of details to memorize anything. It's, you just won't be able to. There's too much to cover. I just want to get you fired up in your faith so that in turn you're more emboldened when you go out and you very graciously share the gospel message. That's really what it's all about. Um, this is a huge, huge, huge issue. There's no way we can cover everything, so this is where we're headed. I'm going to describe our current situation, share some general principles, cover a few specifics, and then generally frustrate you with all that I don't have enough time to cover in detail because, again, we just can't touch everything, but this is kind of the general outline here. And it really is focused on the ultimate authority of Scripture, that this is where we go for our, our orders. In a sense, you know, when you want to know truth, you can go to Scripture, you can trust God, especially when you're confused by some of the science and you hear different things from different people and all might sound good, ultimately we'll go to Scripture and I'll tie that all in when we get to the end. Well, the world we're living in today is certainly turned upside down. It's always been slowly getting worse morally. It's just a, a trend. But a few years ago, the wheels fell off and it is just absolutely crazy today. There's no shortage of issues they're throwing our way. And it's not that any one of these individual issues is too hard. It's that there are too many of them. They're overwhelming the system. You guys remember the entertainers that would be up on stage with all the plates on these rods and they would run around keeping all the plates spinning? That's what we're doing with this. All these issues, we're just kind of going crazy with them. But there's some very important points about these things. Number one is this. These issues are not wrong because they're problematic. They, you know, they're causing problems, so we say, oh, I guess they're wrong. They're problematic because they're wrong. They go against God's created order. That's why we're seeing issues with these things. Quick side note here, climate change. I'll be discussing that as part of this talk. Some of the issues on this screen fall into a slightly different category. It is not proper to say that climate change is right or wrong. Climate change is climate change, and we'll get to that. Our understanding of it or our response to it might be wrong, and I think it is, and we'll get to it, but we just don't want to say, well, yeah, that's wrong. I don't believe in climate change. That would, wouldn't be the proper thing to say. And again, I'll flush that out a little bit later. But no matter what issue anyone brings up, it should never be your philosophy versus theirs. I mean, who are we that the whole world should care what we think about any of these things? Someone brings one up. You say, hold on, interesting topic. Let me see what God's word has to say about that. And if they have a problem with what you're sharing, it's not with you. It's with God's word. And someday they will be accountable for that. It's just up to you to very graciously point out what did God say about the topic they're bringing up. Help them understand why there are so many issues and problems related to that particular topic. Because again, it goes against God's created order. We don't need to shame them or tell them they're a terrible person or that they're wrong or whatever. We just say, this is God's intended order for his creation. And when you do it this way, you run into issues. You know, we want to share it in a very, very caring way. So, two of those things, cancel culture and censorship. The time for debate is over. It's been settled. It's time now for action. And when they say action, they mean what they're telling you they want you to do. It's their action. So it's been settled. No more talk about anything. We've done that. Now it's time for you to do whatever we tell you to do. Well, Richard Feynman, American theoretical physicist, said this, I'd rather have questions that can't be answered than answers that can't be questioned. And I feel the same way. I have no problem not having answers to certain things. Most of my life I've not known everything, <laughs> except when I was a teenager and I knew everything. But it's okay not to have answers, but it's not okay to not be able to question someone's answer. But that's where we are today. You are not allowed to question what they're telling us. George Orwell said this, the more society drifts from the truth, the more they will hate those who speak it. 
And we've seen that more and more. You, you dare to say something that's close to the truth, and basically you get canceled. In fact, the talk you are hearing right now has been banned from YouTube. <laughs> it violated their community standards. That's all I was told. They didn't point out anything that was wrong with what I said. And I don't believe that anyone is sitting there watching all the videos and like, oh, I don't like this, we're going to ban it. It's computerized, so I'm guessing what happened was they found out that I address COVID and climate change, which isn't wrong to address it, but once they knew that it was addressed somewhere in the video, then they probably saw, well, who's this guy? Oh, he's a Christian, he's a creationist. Oh, ban it. It's got to be wrong, got to be bad. So they, they took it down. I have seen, though, that someone else recorded it and put it up on YouTube, and I don't think they found that one yet, so I think it might still be out there. Uh, John 15, 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Think about this. Jesus is God, and when he was here on this planet, everything he did was right and perfect and just. And they hated him, and they killed him. What chance do we have? <laughs> Zero. The good news is God is not asking us to make sure everyone likes us and they're happy with what we say and do. You know, in fact, if everyone is happy with you, you're probably not doing something right. <laughs> in fact, really quick side note, when I was in college, a guy in the room next to me had this huge poster on his wall, and it was of a football field. But the focus was really on the track that was going around the football field with runners on it. And on top of the poster, it said, if once in a while during your life you don't run into Satan, chances are you're going the same direction. It was a very powerful visual. You know, if you're just going along in the Christian life and everything's going really well over and over, day after day, month after month, year after year, you might not be doing what God wants you to do. Because if you're going to be taking a stand for the truth, you're going to run into opposition continually. A quote from an unknown author, it's easier to fool people than to convince them they've been fooled. And that's very true. It's actually not too hard to fool me. Not because I'm overly naive, but I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. So it's, you know, you're not going to get an award for fooling me. But it's tough to convince people they've been fooled. Like you talk to them and say, I know you, you've heard this, but it, it's actually not right. Because then they're going to say, yeah, you're right and all the scientists are wrong. I'm supposed to listen to you with this cute, antiquated, outdated, disproved by science religious book and ignore what the scientists say who are building better technologies and cell phones and landing on the moon and maybe on Mars someday and all the, yeah, I'm just supposed to reject all the science and listen to this, this antiquated religious book that you believe in. That's intimidating, isn't it? But that's the world that we're living in right now. Mark Twain said this, if you don't read the newspapers, you are uninformed. If you do read them, you are misinformed. <laughs> And that's even more true today than ever. I mean, if you don't watch the news broadcasts, you are uninformed. But if you do watch them, you probably have a lot of misinformation that just came your way. <laughs> and it's getting worse and worse. Uh, very quickly, we're going to cover some general principles of science. Um, for many people, science is just out of reach. Maybe you're just not that interested. You don't have a background. Maybe you feel like you can't grasp some of the stuff. Um, even if you have a scientific background, you don't always have access to the actual data. And so for many people, it's kind of out of reach, which means you have to bow at the feet of the scientific magisterium. Whatever they say, you have to go with because they are the experts. But that's okay, right? Because scientists are unbiased, right? We'd like to think so. And many people say, well, yeah, science is unbiased. They just they do experiments and, and that's what it is. Well, if you are a meteorologist, you have one goal, and that's accuracy. If you tell everyone that tomorrow absolutely will not rain out, and then it pours all day long, everyone will know you were wrong. And if you are consistently wrong, you're out of a job, understandably so. But you don't necessarily have that pressure as you know, a regular scientist, pressure to be accurate, because most people aren't going to know if you were right or wrong because you're doing the research, you have all the data and all that, you, they're just listening to your conclusions. And there's a lot of pressure on them from money, politics, peer pressure, prestige. All these things can color what they tell you. It might not be accurate, you don't know that, but they're getting all these pressures behind the scenes to maybe say something different than what they wanted to say. 
And science should never be political, but it's becoming way, way, way too political, way too often now. And the word science, especially biblically speaking, simply means knowledge. It does not mean wisdom. You know, they say wisdom comes with age, but it's not a requirement. You can just get older. <laughs> um, but these scientists, I don't doubt at all that they're very intelligent. A lot of facts in their head. But wisdom is the application, proper application of this information. Proverbs 9.10 says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Many of these scientists, they don't fear God. A lot of them don't even believe in God. So they might be smart people. They might even come up with some cool technology. But they lack wisdom, which is really the only thing that counts. And then people might ask you, well, what do you believe? Do you believe science or do you believe the Bible? That's an awkward question for many Christians to address. See, if you say you believe the Bible, that implies you don't believe science. And then the skeptic's going to say, you know, I could have sworn I saw you on your cell phone earlier today, but oh, that's right, you don't believe in science that made that cell phone. So when you say, well, no, I, I believe in science. But if you say you believe in science, that implies you don't believe the Bible. If you don't believe the Bible, you can't be a Christian. Again, awkward question. Why is it awkward? Because there's a hidden assumption here. The hidden assumption is that science has disproved the Bible. And if that were true, yeah, then you can't believe in both. You've got to choose one or the other. But that's a false assumption. In fact, most major areas of science that we have today were founded by Bible-believing Christians. If you'd like a few examples, I brought a few along. <laughs> Antiseptic surgery, bacteriology, calculus, chemistry, computer science, electronics, electrodynamics, electromagnetics, fluid mechanics, galactic astronomy, gas dynamics, genetics, <laughs> hydraulics, hydrostatics, oceanography, optical mineralogy, paleontology, pathology, physical astronomy, stratigraphy, thermodynamics, thermokinetics, vertebrate paleontology, and a scientific method, all founded by Bible-believing Christians. <laughs> Anyone who says that no real scientist believes the Bible, they don't only not understand science, they don't even know history. This is where science came from, was birthed out of the Christian community. Most scientists know that, they just don't like to admit it. But the definition of science has been hijacked over the years. A very, very simple, basic definition of science could be this. It's the discovering explanations for the natural world around us. These men and some women who gave us these areas of science, they just took for granted that God created everything. It was a kind of a no-brainer. It was so obvious that, yes, of course, God created it. There's no way it came out of nothing for no reason. So, yes, God's the creator. And if God is a God of order, which is what it says in Scripture, they expected to see order in his natural creation. So they started studying, and they started finding these regularities and formulated different formulas and areas of science. That's how science generated. They were studying the natural world, coming up with explanations for kind of how God did it. How was it operating? What did God do to sustain his creation? But it's been subtly hijacked. Watch how this definition subtly changes. Now it's discovering natural explanations for the world around us. They are only considering natural explanations for everything that they're looking at. Dr. Scott Todd from Kansas State University said, even if all the data point to an intelligent designer, such an hypothesis is excluded from science because it's not naturalistic. What's he saying? Even if all the data, the evidence, proves, points towards a creator, a god, a designer, we're just going to throw it out because that's not a natural explanation and we're only looking for natural explanations. So if the data does seem to lean that way, we could just say, well, that's obviously not science then. Because science just deals with natural things because they decided that. That was a philosophical decision. That was not a scientific conclusion like, oh, I guess science only deals with natural explanations. No, that was their decision philosophically to totally change the direction science was going. Well, here's an analogy. If I wanted each one of you to write a 100-page research paper on the origin of this laptop, but here's the catch. Nowhere in your paper can you ever refer to human beings, men and women, scientists, engineers, programmers. You come up with some pretty crazy stories of how we got a laptop. Can't talk about people. That's what many of our science textbooks are filled with. They are trying to explain the origin of the universe, the origin of life, and many other things apart from intelligence, apart from purpose, apart from design. So they're coming up with some pretty, pretty crazy stories of where everything came from. Quick side note, it's not part of the talk, I won't charge you for this. Um, Lawrence Krauss, 
theoretical physicist, brilliant guy. He's an atheist. So he has to address this issue of, you know, where did the universe come from if there's no God? So he has to kind of talk about how it came out of nothing. So this is what he said. When people think about nothing, they tend, tend to think about the absence of anything. Yeah, that, that seems correct. He goes, but that's a philosophical definition. He goes, I don't care what philosophers think about nothing. I care about the nothing of reality. And if the nothing of reality was filled with stuff, I'll go with that. What? This is a brilliant scientist who lacks wisdom, brilliant scientist who says you can get something out of nothing because the nothing isn't nothing, it's filled with something. So something could produce something. Well, where did that something come from? Well, they don't really have an answer for that. But, so you just redefine things. You redefine science, and now you redefine nothing to mean actually lots of stuff. It's just, it, it makes no sense, but our science textbooks are filled with stuff like that. And people say, yeah, but science says, this is what science says. Nothing. Science doesn't say anything. It says nothing at all. Facts don't speak for themselves. Scientists <laughs> say stuff. They look at things, they do science, they look at things, and then they tell us their opinions about what they saw and what they did. Here's another myth about science. It's black and white. The scientists go into the laboratory, they do their experiment, they come out and they say, I'm sorry, this is just what it is, there's nothing we can do about it, it's black and white, can't argue with it. No, science is actually very, very colorful. There's a lot of assumptions that go into their experiments and their conclusions and they're analyzing the data and all that. It is very colorful. And science is often used as a club to bully us into submission, into doing whatever it is they want us to do. I'm going to give you a bunch of examples. I'm actually going to go through each one of these, but it's going to be pretty quick. Start out by looking at what we call being overly technical. This is when a speaker is talking about something and it is so deep and so technical, you don't have a clue what they're talking about. How can you possibly argue back when you don't really even understand it? Now, some people are overly technical because they're not really gifted at speaking. And that's fine. Not everyone has you know, every gift. But very often, they do that on purpose so that you can't say anything back. No matter how complex something is, you should be able to describe it in somewhat of a simple fashion so you can have a discussion. I could teach a sixth grader how computer programming works. I did programming for 12 years. You see, you sit down in front of the computer and you type in instructions into the computer. The computer reads the instructions and then it carries out those instructions. That is computer programming. That is 100% accurate. It's not 100% detailed. <laughs> They're all a detail, left a lot of detail out, but it's accurate. And you could have a discussion about that. So when they're being overly technical, a lot of times because they don't want pushback or discussion. Then we have elephant hurling. This is where they throw out these large, vacuous statements that really don't mean a whole lot, not any specifics behind there. So they'll say, well, evolution is an absolute fact. It's proven by evidence from every area of science, and all scientists believe it. So they're just throwing all these huge statements out with no specifics behind it. So we see that a lot. It's very intimidating. All scientists believe it. And that's not even true. It's backed up by evidence from every area of science. Give me some examples. You know. So again, just these large statements. So be on the lookout for when someone is saying this, usually emotionally, large statements lacking the specifics. Appeal to authority. Well, this particular thing must be true because these people who are telling us this are world's leading authorities in that area. Well, you know what? They might be world's leading authorities. But that doesn't mean that everything they say is true. It has to be backed up by evidence, not just the fact that they've got you know, some degrees behind their name or they're, they're leading authorities. Then we have shaming. If you don't believe what we're telling you and do what we tell you to do, you obviously don't care. You're a science denier, and you don't care that people are dying because you're not doing A, B, and C. This works very well. We've seen that in the last few years. A lot of people do something, even though it didn't make sense to them, they don't want to be shamed. So they, they do it just to kind of go along to, to show everyone else, I care. Third, eliminate discussion. We already talked about this a little bit. Just shut it down, cancel it. If it goes against the narrative, don't even let it be broadcast. That happens a lot. Consensus science. Well, this particular thing must be true because the vast majority of scientists believe it. Well, maybe they do. That doesn't make it right. Even secular scientists hate this concept of consensus science. They'll usually be the first to say that's not how science works. There has to be evidence, and often it's one person 
or one fact that overturns something that was believed for years and years and years. It takes evidence, not a majority vote. We don't vote on truth and science. Uh, academic censorship. Well, we won't publish your research because you're not real scientists. Okay, why are we not real scientists? Because you don't publish in our journal. Why can't we publish in your journal? Because you're not real scientists. Why are we not real scientists? Because you don't publish in our journal. And round and round, and that's literal. I've got examples I don't have time for right now, but that will literally happen. And the doggy head tilt. <laughs> this is where someone says something, you're like, what? You know, it doesn't make any sense. This is my, my daughter's dog, Cooper. Yes, he's cute, and yes, he knows it. But again, you hear something like, what? Here's an example. Creation theory is not science because it's not testable. Then they'll turn around and say, we have tested creation theory and proven it to be false. <laughs> Wait a minute, if you tested it, then it is testable and it's science. But if you can't test it, then you didn't test it. You know, it's just, so this doesn't make any sense. It makes you kind of, but you gotta use critical thinking skills and pay attention to what someone's saying. The last one, misleading headlines. This is very, very common, very, very powerful. So this is something I would urge you to think about and look for going forward. So let's say there's a headline out there, either in an article, on the web, on the television, and it says, recent discovery proves Darwinian ape to, ev ev uh, ape to man evolution. That's the headline, okay? The vast, vast majority of people will see the headline, they won't read the article, but they'll have further proof that evolution is true and creation is wrong. They'll say, there's more evidence that those silly creationists are wrong. When are they gonna give up their views on the Bible? Just, they're just crazy. Oh, they didn't learn anything. They saw the headline. That's all they wanted. That's all they, they saw it. That's all they need. I'm sure it's all backed up there. So that, that's the vast majority of people that see the headline. They don't read anything. Some people will start reading. And the article starts off with, in 1831, so and so, and they're like, ah. I don't have time. I just, what did you discover last week? That's what I wanted to know, and I don't, I don't have time, so they move on. They didn't read it. Some people read all the way through, but they're thinking about where they're going to lunch, and so they're not even focusing on what they're reading. Then a tiny, tiny percentage of people will actually read all the way through. They get to the end, and they say, wait a minute. There is literally nothing in this article that backs up that headline. In fact, at the end, they close with saying, however, many scientists remain skeptical. Just like, it doesn't back up the headline. It didn't need to. The damage has been done. 99.9% .9 of all the people got proof of evolution just by the headline. And those who do read it all the way through, they're just, well, you move on. You're not gonna like write to the editor. And it's just, but that happens. In fact, if you go through those articles and you use a highlighter and highlight all the fuzzy words, might have, could have, perhaps, we believe, maybe, there's hardly anything left. And what you, what you have is an actual fact in the whole article is, well, I guess they did find a rock. That is true, they have a rock. Everything else is possibly, might have, could be, we think, we theorize, you know. But uh, other scientists remain skeptical. So, and science is truly never really settled. Think about this, they tell us eggs are good, and then they say, eggs are bad. Then they say aspirin is good, and they say aspirin is bad. Then they say chocolate is good, and then they say chocolate is good. <laughs> Don't fight me on that one, you will lose. <laughs> But, I mean, they keep changing their mind on things. You know, it's just the, the flavor of the day, whatever it is. They keep changing their mind. Now, if you want to know which is more dense, lead or cotton, I'm okay with that being settled because you could have thousands of scientists coming in doing the same experiment. Some of them are atheists, some of them are Christians, some of them are Muslims or whatever. They're doing the same experiments the same way. They're getting the same result. We could call that settled. I don't have a problem with that. And so I don't leave you hanging. It's lead. Lead is more dense than, than cotton. <laughs> so, here are some examples of when science was wrong. Now guess what? Science has never, ever, ever, ever been wrong. Because it doesn't say anything. <laughs> this is when scientists were wrong about their conclusions. And we could go on all night with examples, but here's just a few. The concept of bloodletting. Doctors used to drain blood out of people's bodies when they got sick. It's bad blood, you gotta get the blood out of there. Even though Leviticus 17 says the life of the flesh is in the blood, we know that now you don't do this anymore. Um, in fact, that's largely how George Washington died. He got pneumonia, so he's sick, he goes to the doctor. Doctor says, this guy's sick, 
we know what to do, get the bad blood out of him. They drain some blood, he got sicker. It's like, wow, this guy's really sick. They drained some more blood. He got sicker, surprise. It's like, this guy is so sick. They ended up draining almost a gallon of blood out of him and he died. No surprise, we know better now. You do not do that. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Reason I have a picture of a barber pole up here, you used to be able to go to the barber to have your blood drained. Some of you might remember that. It's called the bloodletting. They would give you a cylinder like this to grasp onto, cut your arm, drain some blood, wrap a towel around there to help stop the bleeding and absorb some blood. Sometimes they would take the used towels and hang them on the cylinder to dry and the wind would catch it and wrap around the pole. That's why today barber poles have red stripes. Actually true, free trivia, I won't charge you for that either. But next time you see a barber pole, be, be thinking about that. I have a whole talk where I explain that even further. Ignis Semmelweis, Hungarian doctor in the 1800s. At that time, the mortality rate in Europe for women going to the hospital to deliver a baby was 25 to 30 percent. What does that mean? That means 25 to 30 percent of women going to have a baby at the hospital, they never came home. They died in the hospital. That is not good. That's just horrendous. Well, Dr. Semmelweis noticed something. This will turn your stomach. He noticed doctors going into one room and performing an autopsy. They'd walk across the hall and deliver a baby with no prep in between. I mean, can you even imagine that? But that's what they were doing. So he started in his own practice washing with water and chlorine. And he got his own practice down to 0.85% mortality rate. That's a huge, huge improvement. You can imagine how elated and excited the other doctors were to say, thank you for discovering this. Nope. Stop with all the hand-washing nonsense. They put this guy in a mental institute, locked him up. He was severely beaten by guards when he tried to escape, and he died two weeks later at the age of 47. We know better today, but that's when scientists and doctors were totally, totally wrong. But we're supposed to listen to everything that they say. We used to put mercury in our medicine, and now we work very hard at getting mercury out of everything, fish and all these things, but we used to actually put it in the medicine. We know better now. Concept of junk DNA. Scientists were studying DNA. It seemed like only 2% of our DNA did anything. Coded to make proteins that carry out all the functions in our bodies. The other 98%, this is junk, not doing anything. It's actually proof of evolution. See, if, if God designed you, he wouldn't design you so that 98% of your DNA didn't do anything. This is proof of evolution. Well, they studied it further, and now they know the 98% they were calling junk, it's more complex than the 2%. It's instructions, telling the 2% what to do. It's just blowing them away how complex it is. I have an entire talk just on DNA, very, very complex. Calls one evolutionist to say this, the failure to recognize the implications of non-coding DNA, that's what they were calling junk, the 98%. It will go down as the biggest mistake in the history of molecular biology. Big, big mistake to ever call that junk. Creationists weren't calling it junk. They were saying, we don't understand this fully yet, but let's keep studying it because we believe it was designed by God where the evolutionists were writing it off. We don't need to even look at it. It's junk. It's proof of evolution. Belief in creation drove better science. Now, we're going to take all those general principles and we're going to look at two specific topics now. COVID-19 and climate change. No controversy here. <laughs> if you like controversy, you came to the right place. And this is probably why the video got banned maybe. And it hit each one of these things. Start out looking at COVID-19 and the concept of follow the science. This is when they were really pushing follow the science. Do what we tell you to do because they've done the science for us and we're just following whatever it is, right? Well, again, it's more like follow their science, whatever they've done and whatever their conclusions are. This is WebMD, very prestigious uh, website in the medical world. The title of their article was The Year of COVID. Here's the subtitle. Everything we thought we knew was wrong. That's their title. Did they say they were off on a few areas? Well, they said everything we thought we knew was wrong. What happened to follow the science? It pretty much means everything they told us to do was wrong because they were wrong about what they thought they knew. But of course, now they know. I mean, okay, fine, we were wrong before, but now we really know. That has been, to me, the most frustrating thing, like having a science background, mostly the education. Your professors will tell you, uh, we, you know, we used to teach this, but we, we now know that's wrong. Now we know it's this. 
A couple of years later, they'll say, okay, well, that was wrong too, but now we know because we have so much more research now. Now we know it's this. And then that we find out is wrong too. That's how science works. There's nothing wrong with science, but it progresses that way. But they're always so dogmatic at every point in time. Now we know. Okay, fine. You keep pointing out how we were wrong. Well, no one knows everything, but now we have so much more data, and now we know. You know they should say, okay, it looks like that was wrong. Now it's looking more like this is probably true. But they're always dogmatic all along the way. That reminded me of this cover of Time magazine. It said, the truth about dinosaurs. Captivating cover title. Because what are you going to think? Like, the truth about dinosaurs? I want to know the truth. So you're going to get the magazine, right? There was a subtitle on this one as well, and I thought, they did not think through this. I'm surprised they put it on there. It said, surprise, just about everything you believe is wrong. Where did most people get their information about dinosaurs? From Time Magazine and Science and Smithsonian and National Geographic. But now we're being told all that was wrong. That means they were wrong when they told us. Well, if they're admitting they were wrong when they told us before, why should we trust them now? It, again, it doesn't make any sense. So, we're going to look at COVID-19 treatments. Caveats, I am not a doctor. I don't have a white lab coat. I don't have a stethoscope. I cannot spell stethoscope. <laughs> um, I am not going to tell you vaccines are good or bad. You should get vaccinated. You should not get vaccinated. I actually have very, very strong opinions in all these areas. I am not smart enough or important enough for you to know what I think. <laughs> you want to talk to me afterwards, that's fine, but I'm not going to travel around the country telling people what they should do with vaccines and all. No, you can research it and follow the leading that God gives you in your life based on whatever research ultimately followed the Holy Spirit, what he's telling you to do. All I want to do is talk about things that have happened in the name of science that are massive red flags that should never be occurring, should upset Everyone, whether you've had 50 million vaccines or never get the vaccine, everyone should be upset about what has gone on. One of them is related to the CDC, which is this organization that apparently dropped out of heaven to solve all of our problems. <laughs> they were talking about hydroxychloroquine. You've all heard about that. It was first developed in the 40s to treat malaria. It was very, very successful. This is what the CDC said. A study had been conducted where there were 96,000 COVID-19 patients from 671 hospitals on five continents. They were all treated with hydroxychloroquine. Okay. Then the results were published in The Lancet, the world's leading medical journal. If you are a doctor, you probably want to subscribe to this because there's so much medical information out there and there's no way any doctor can know all of it. You kind of specialize and you rely on things like The Lancet to keep you up to date with everything else. So, the results of this study were published about hydroxychloroquine, claiming that it did not help curb COVID-19 and it could even cause death in patients. So picture you're a doctor doing the best you can and you got all these patients that have COVID-19 coming to you and you were thinking, yeah, I'll give you hydroxychloroquine. I've heard really good things about it. But now you read this, oh, apparently it's not helping them and it could even kill them. There's no way I could do that. I'm not being responsible for that. I don't want any of my patients to die. I would feel horrible if my patients died and they'd say, it says in the Lancet this would happen and you gave it to them anyway. So the doctors just backed off. Some doctors said, that's kind of interesting because I, I don't remember seeing the actual study. You know, these are the conclusions. I don't remember seeing the study. Well, it's no surprise. It never happened. That study never occurred. You can't have results from a study that never occurred. Why would the Lancet produce the results on a study that didn't happen? What happened to peer review and all those things? And the Lancet, so prestigious. Damage has been done. It's like the headline that went out. It's in the Lancet. That's all you need to know. You don't need to see the study. You don't have time for that when you're a doctor. That's a red flag, whether you get vaccinated or not. Follow the science. It's often more follow the money. It's a whole other rabbit trail. I'm not going down that one. Rolling Stone had an article about ivermectin. This is what it said. Oklahoma hospitals were overwhelmed by patients who have overdosed on ivermectin, so much so they could not treat gunshot victims. So people were getting shot, going to the ER. They couldn't help them. We got too many people who have overdosed on ivermectin. What does that tell you? I better not do the ivermectin thing. People are overdosing it and they're going to the hospitals. Well, that's terrible. Stay away from that. That never happened, ever. 
But because it was in Rolling Stone and CNN and ABC and CBS and you know, ABC and all the other news outlets, they just they quote the story. And so no matter what station you go to or article you read, they're all saying the same thing. So you learn, don't do the ivermectin thing, that's awful. And you quote, know it now, because it's coming from all the experts everywhere you go. You would be a fool to mess with ivermectin, right? I mean, logically, that's probably the conclusion you'd come to. Again, I'm not saying you should use this or not. I have opinions, but that's not important. The important thing is the red flag. That should never happen. What happened to follow the science? We're going to move very quickly so I don't get into trouble into climate change. I'll get in trouble in climate change probably. But um, climate change is related to the Great Reset, the Green New Deal, and environmentalism. The Green New Deal is this, that the government should prohibit the use of fossil fuels and switch through mandates, that means forcing to the use of 100% renewable energy. That's what the Green New Deal is all about. Today, about 80% of our energy usage comes from the fossil fuels. Well, that's the coal, oil, and natural gas. Only about three and a half or so, maybe it's up to five or even maybe 6% now, comes from solar and wind. What's the problem with solar and wind? Well, basically unreliable. It only works when the wind's blowing, and the sun's shining. And you probably remember last year in the Dallas area where the pinwheels froze <laughs> and it shut things down. It was not good at all. I mean, it was very close to being unbelievably disastrous. So they weren't planning that. These things just are not reliable. And we are close to being maxed out in efficiency because of something called physics. <laughs> You can only get so efficient converting sunlight to energy and wind to energy. And we're pretty close to those maximums already. We are not going to see great gains in these areas. Plus, you have to store the energy in batteries to then be able to use it later. Tesla has built the world's largest battery factory. It would take Tesla 500 years to build enough batteries to power the U.S. for one day. It is just not feasible at this point. And you have to mine a lot more minerals and materials to make the pinwheels and the solar panels and the batteries. And when these things wear out, you throw them on the landfills because they are non-renewable materials. And you have to burn a lot more oil and coal to run the factories to make the solar panels and the windmills and all these things. So it just doesn't make that much sense. So should we get rid of solar and wind? No, I'm not saying get rid of it. We just shouldn't be totally switching over to it until it's ready, and we're not even close. So I'm fine with them looking into it more and trying to come up with creative ideas. That's fine. Do that in parallel. Work on that as we're refining other resources, looking into nuclear or whatever, but don't force us to switch to something that isn't even close to being capable of doing what it needs to do. Related to all this, too, is overpopulation. We've been told for many, many years that the Earth is overpopulated. We are eating up all our resources. This is just disastrous. We've got to get the population down big time. Current population, I forgot I was going to update this. We just hit 8 billion very recently. So this, we'll just say 8 billion for this talk. There's basically 8 billion people on the planet today. This is a very, very powerful visual. You could take every single person on the planet today and stand them side by side, and they would fit in the state of Texas. But they wouldn't take up the whole state. 0.1% of the state, the rest of the planet would be empty. I, I did the math on it. I, I didn't believe it at first either. I did the square footage thing and all that. If he, each person is standing in a square foot, I'm not saying they're going to live there very long, but they would fit there and the rest of the planet would be empty. Is the world overcrowded? No. Are there areas that are overcrowded? Yeah, China, India, too many people living in one spot. But there's plenty of space on this planet. It's not like God's looking down and saying, oh my word, I had no idea what these people were going to do. I should have made it so much bigger. <laughs> God knew how long we would be here, and he knew how many people would be on this planet. So, question comes up, though, can we get this many people, 7.88 billion people in just 6,000 years. Again, obviously this relates to the creation scenario. It is very clearly no question 2,000 years from us back to Christ. Even atheists know that a guy named Jesus lived 2,000 years ago. Back to Abraham, another 2,000 years. So that puts Abraham about 4,000 years before we are here today. 
and then you look at the biblical genealogies and chronologies from Abraham back to Adam, you get roughly another 2,000 years. So can we really get almost 8 billion people here, starting with just two? So let's start out with just one couple here, maybe not that couple. They're probably not going to have kids. No, this couple here. <laughs> so we start out with one couple here. It would only take 32 doublings to get eight and a half billion people. That's more than we actually have today. You just have to double it 32 times. Two, four, eight, 16. 32 times. All right, in order to double 32 times in 6,000 years, you only have to double once every 187 years. Now, you probably wouldn't know, is this reasonable? Is this crazy? Can we actually double the population in just 187 years? Today, we're doubling in every 40 to 50 years. That's what's naturally happened now. It would be no problem doubling in 187 years. And that's all you have to do to come up with the population that we have today. It fits in with the biblical scenario. The bigger question is this. How many people should be on the planet if we've been evolving from an ape-like creature for 6 million years? That's what they teach. We started evolving from an ape-like creature 6 million years ago. Let's be conservative. Let's not talk about evolution from an ape-like creature. Let's just talk about the appearance of modern man. They tell us modern man has been around maybe 200,000 years. Let's be even more conservative. Let's say we've only been around in our modern form for 50,000 years. So how many people should be on the planet if we started reproducing just 50,000 years ago? It's a good question. Here's the number. That's a one with a hundred zeros. Just this portion up here is more than we have. That's 10 billion. <laughs> That's more than we have. We gotta get this whole number here. That's a big number, so let's look at some big numbers here. You could fit a lot of atoms in a single grain of sand. In fact, in a single grain of sand, there are 20 million trillion atoms in a single grain of sand. That is a massive number, but guess what? This massive number, that's much smaller than the population should be today. So let's talk about a bigger number. How about the number of atoms in the entire known universe? That number would have to be massive, right? Atoms in the entire known universe? Oh, that's much smaller than the population should be today. You would need 100 million trillion universes. Count all those atoms, and you'd finally get to this number, which is what the population should be today if we've been growing conservatively just for 50,000 years. That's crazy. Oh, but we've grown so slowly over 50,000 years or 6 million years, we just now reached 8 billion. That's not feasible at all, but even if that happened, the question is, where are all the artifacts and skeletons of all the people who have lived and died during that time? We should be drowning in them. But archeologists get really excited when they found a foot bone or something like that, because it's pretty rare but we should be tripping over them everywhere we go. If we've been around that long and there have been that many people that lived and died over the, that time period. I notice many of you are as old as I am or older. Um, you remember Jacques Cousteau. I loved watching his program as oceanographer. This is what he said. In order to stabilize world population, we must, you need to eliminate 350,000 people per day. What do they mean by eliminate? There are a lot of people in high levels of government who are very serious about getting the population down and they have very scary solutions to how they can do that. I'll get myself in trouble. Some people will even tie in the COVID thing with an effort to get the population down. We can call it conspiracy theory, you can make your own conclusions, but it is one thing that would work towards that goal. Not saying what I think about that, I'm just saying there's a lot of that talk going on because we have to do something or mankind is going to be gone. So whatever, you know, the ends justify the means, right? So world population is really not an issue, but there's alarmism because a picture is worth a thousand words. So they tell you the earth is overcrowded. They show you parts of India or China. And you're like, oh my word, this is kind of crazy. We need to do something. Maybe we as Christians should lead the way of stop having children. Yeah, have less Christians around. <laughs> That'll really be helpful. They might like that, but so it's not an issue. God knew what he was doing with this planet. It's not an issue, but they will make it an issue by showing you pictures and telling you their narrative. Back more specifically to climate change. I mentioned before that climate change is climate change. Climate has always been changing. It always will. I guarantee you, if the climate ever stopped changing, levels out, 
the alarms will be going off and they will be screaming, the climate has always changed, but now it's not, and you're causing it to not change and that's bad, we gotta do something. That's what'll happen if it ever levels out. Well, this is interesting, this is really recent, uh, 2002 United Nations Climate Change Conference. We are in the fight of our lives and we are losing. I mean, you hear people you know, chanting that and screaming that, and here's the subtitle down here, climate change, humanity must cooperate or perish. If you don't cooperate, we're gonna perish. That's the shaming thing. If you don't do what we're telling you to do, you obviously don't care about mankind, you just care about yourself, but we are gonna be extinct as a species if you don't act immediately. Well, they've been saying immediately for 50 plus years, which we'll get into in just a little bit. Uh, interesting thing about Gla Glacier National Park, I was out there two years ago lecturing and hiking, uh, there had been a sign out there that said this, glaciers will be all gone by the year 2020. It said the glaciers are rapidly shrinking due to human caused climate change. So not only are they shrinking, they're shrinking because of climate change, not just climate change, but climate change caused by humans. So there's a lot in this message here that they're packing a lot in there. Then it says computer models indicate the glaciers will be uh, all be gone by the year 2020. So, I mean, computer models, you cannot argue with a computer model. If the computer says it, that's, that's gospel, right? <laughs> Again, I did computer programming for years. That's <laughs> not true at all. You can make it say whatever you want it to say. But this is what the sign said. Again, I was out there hiking and I noticed the uh, glaciers are still there. There is something that's missing, <laughs> the sign. <laughs> they took this... <laughs> They took the sign down because it was just terribly wrong. The glaciers are, are alive and well. They're doing, they're doing very well, actually. <laughs> so I, I mentioned 50 years. 2020 was the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. The first Earth Day we had was 1970. Many of you were alive back then. Um, we're going to look at some of the 13 failed predictions of Earth Day. So this is what they were saying 50 years ago, 52 years ago now. Again, alarmism, screaming, just like we hear today. This is what they were saying 50 years ago. We're going to look at maybe uh, five or six of these 13. Number one, civilization will end within 15 to 30 years unless immediate action is taken against the problems facing mankind. That would have been between 85 and 2000. Maybe I missed it, but it seems like we're still around it. Terribly wrong on that one. Number four, population will inevitably and completely outstrip whatever small increases in food supplies we make. The death rate will increase until at least 100 to 200 million people per year will be starving to death during the next 10 years. That's 1970 to 1980. I missed that one too. Number eight, in a decade, urban dwellers will have to wear gas masks to survive air pollution. By 1985, air pollution will have reduced the amount of sunlight reaching the earth by one half. I mean, can you even imagine wearing a mask? Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Been there, done that. 85, uh, again, that didn't happen. Number nine, at the present rate of nitrogen buildup, it's only a matter of time before light will be filtered out of the atmosphere and none of our land will be usable. Totally wrong. <laughs> The last one, number 13, the world has been chilling sharply for about 20 years. If present trends continue, the world will be about four degrees colder for the global mean temperature in 1990, but 11 degrees colder by the year 2000. This is about twice what it would take to put us into an ice age. 1970, they were worried about the ice age. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. I give them an F minus for their predictions. <laughs> But they're saying the same thing now. If immediate action isn't taken right now, mankind will be gone. So we must listen to them. Forget the man behind the curtain in 1970 who said all these things. Listen to us now. Might have been wrong then, but they, they weren't as smart as we are because we are advanced now. We've done so much more research. So, I mean, just keep that in mind. There are three huge questions that need to be asked and addressed in order to have any rational um, conversation about climate change. Three huge questions. In fact, they're so big, I couldn't get them to fit on the screen. <laughs> so, <clears throat> first question is, is the climate changing? Second question, if the climate is changing, is the change actually bad? And then, how much of the change, if any, is due or caused by human activity? Those are very important questions. If you don't answer those, then everything else is kind of meaningless. 
So let's address these things. Is the climate changing? Yes. I mean, we talked about that. It's always changed. Here's a little brief history. 950 to 1250 AD was slightly warmer than it is today, about one degree Celsius. They called that the medieval warm period. 1300 to 1850 AD, temperatures dropped about two degrees Celsius. They refer to that as the, the little ice age. Then after that, 20th, 21st century, the warming started but stagnated in the past 20 years. So we came out of that little ice age. 2016 on, temperatures declined slightly about 0.2 degrees Celsius. So there's been variation throughout history. We've been tracking it. We know that it has changed. So the, the answer to that is clearly yes, the, the climate has changed. If the climate is changing, is it bad? Uh, I don't have time for this other than one analogy, which should be helpful. Let's say there's a guy, uh, he's going to go outside, and you find out it's snowing out, it's cold outside, so he's going to change. So he puts on an undershirt. You're like, well, that would be good. I mean, it's cold out, that should help. Then he puts on a t-shirt. You're like, well, again, that should help. It's a good change because he's going to go outside. Then he puts on a nice sweater. He's like, okay, that, that change, that's really going to help because, again, he's going outside, it's snowing out. Then you find out he's, he's not actually going outside for another half an hour. At that rate of change, he's going to be the Michelin tire man. He's going to get out there. He will fall over. He won't be able to get up. He'll freeze to death overnight. Just, just terrible. What you did is you took some actual change and you extrapolated it. If that keeps going, this is disastrous. Well, think about this. Let's say it's one degree warmer tomorrow than it is today. If that trend continues, we're going to be dead in not long. Then two degrees, and I mean 300 days from now, it'll be 300 degrees warmer, we'll be dead. That's awful. So they take these trends and they put it in their models and they tell us this is disastrous. And they get some of it from like drilling ice cores, which you don't have time to too many details, but they'll, they'll go through these layers of the ice and they'll count the layers. And let's say they counted supposedly 30,000 layers in the ice core here. This was from 30,000 years ago. And they'll check carbon dioxide levels and they will tell you what the Earth's atmosphere was like 30,000 years ago. And then they will put all that data into their climate models and spit out stuff to say, yeah, we got to get the carbon dioxide down or we're going to be dead. You've got to do what we're telling you to do. Give up your car. Don't do this. Don't do that. Well, they're assuming that each layer represents a year. We have to know for a fact that it doesn't work that way. You can get multiple layers in a single year. In a winter, you get a layer and then it gets a little bit warmer out in the winter. It melts a little bit and you get another layer. And then it melts you know, cooler and warmer periods during the winter. You get multiple layers. There's a lot of, there's whole studies on this. Uh, Mike Ord has done a, a lot of research on Ice Age and things like that. So if this isn't 30,000 years ago, then us, they're telling us what the weather was like back is useless and they're putting that in their climate models. Well, then the output of their climate models is garbage. It's very similar to radiometric dating when they tell you a certain layer in the Grand Canyon is you know, 200 million years old. Well, radiometric dates are off because of assumptions behind them. You've probably had lectures on that. I give many talks on that. But again, when they're telling us what the Earth was like 200 million years ago and all these changes, if it wasn't 200 million years ago, if those layers were deposited by a global flood 4,500 years ago, you think that would change your data a little bit? <laughs> I mean, it would totally invalidate everything you have, but that's what they base it on, all these assumptions. So oh, third question, how much of the change, if any, is caused by human activity? I decided to kind of skip this one altogether. This one is debatable. You can bring people up on the stage and say that we're terrible, we're ruining the planet. Other people say, no, it's really not that bad, and we can go on and on. Personally, yes, we have an effect, and I think as Christians, we need to be good stewards of the earth. Should we recycle? Yeah, that can help. Pick up garbage? Yes. Use things efficiently? Yes, we should really, we should be leading in, the, in those reasonable efforts. But what we shouldn't be doing is going overboard with all this and then murdering millions of babies. Oh, who cares about babies' abortion? That's okay. But make sure you take the plastics and put them in here. And, you know, you know, so again, we don't want to go too far and not care about the environment. We should be really good stewards and examples of that. But I just don't think that what we are doing is a significant contributing factor. But if we're not, then they can't come at us to say, give us more money, give up your freedoms and all that, if it's not our problem. So that's why it's always going to be your fault. Again, I mentioned in the 1970s, they were worried about the Ice Age that came, you know, it was coming. The Science News said the Ice Age cometh, 1975. That did not work well for them. So they went from global cooling to global warming. That did not work well for them, so they became very, very clever, and they changed to climate change. <laughs> now, any change at all is bad, and you're causing it. 
That's all you need to know. The change is bad and it's your fault. Okay, please, just solve it. Whatever you want. Take whatever money you need and whatever freedoms, just please solve it for me so that we don't die. I want my grandchildren to live in a prosperous world. You know, so whatever change happens, it's bad and it's your fault. I'm going to wind down with the summary of climate change. It comes from Prager U. This is Richard Linsden. He is an MIT atmospheric physicist. He's one of the world's leading climatologists, which means everything he says is correct, right? <laughs> no. Doesn't mean that, but he's got an impressive enough background that we probably should listen to what he has to say. And this is what he said. And again, I think this is brilliant. When you're talking about climate change, there are three groups of people that we're dealing with. The first two groups are made up of scientists. The third group is politicians, environmentalists, and the media. The first group of scientists, this is the International Panel on Climate Change. This is a small group of scientists, smart people, and they're, they're very concerned about climate change. They mostly believe that recent warming is due to man's burning of fossil fuels, of oil, coal, and natural gas. The second group of scientists, massive group, these, they call them skeptics or climate deniers. They don't deny climate. They're just not as alarmed as other people are. They believe that there are many reasons the climate changes. We've got solar flares and activities, clouds, oceans, orbital variations. I mean, the interaction between clouds and the ocean is so complex. There are many things that, that change climate and that none of these factors are truly understood and that there's no evidence that CO2 emissions are the dominant factor. That's what group two believes. Here are five points of agreement between these two groups, the small group that are really concerned and then all these other scientists. They all agree the climate is always changing. We, we talked about that. Number two, they all agree CO2 is a greenhouse gas that's necessary for life and adding more would lead to some warming. We know that. Three, atmospheric CO2 has been increasing since the end of the Little Ice Age, since the mid-1800s, which is good because no one wants to live in that Little Ice Age all the time. So everyone's happy that the Earth warmed up out of that little ice age. Four, over the past 200 years, the Earth's temperature has increased slightly and erratically about one degree Celsius. It's only been since the 1960s that man's activities have been sufficient enough to play a role. Number five, no confident prediction of the future global average temperatures or its impact can be made. Even the group of scientists on this panel who are extremely ex concerned about climate change, they're admitting we can't make any confident predictions about this because there are too many variables. This is the shocker too. No one in either of these groups is claiming that the burning of fossil fuels leads to catastrophe. None of them are saying that. So where's the alarmism coming from? Oh, group three. <laughs> the politicians, environmentalists, and the media. Well, the politicians are driven by money and power. We know that. <laughs> environmentalists are driven by money for their organizations and confirmation of their religious-like beliefs that man is an evil disease destroying nature. The media are driven by ideology, money, and headlines. <laughs> so climate change, again, is climate change. They're using it kind of as a club to get you to do whatever they're telling you must be done to save humanity. So wrapping this whole thing up, a few takeaways. This is the most important part of the talk probably. Scientifically, whether it's COVID, climate change, or whatever, you will never really know. Because either you don't have a science background, you're not interested in it, you are interested, but you don't have access to their data. You're just listening to what they're telling you about it, so you can't really even get at that data. So you really, never really know for sure, for sure, for sure, even if you saw the data, you might see new data a month from now that you change your own mind on it. So you're never going to be in a position where now I really, 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 really know scientifically. Secondly, settled science is really more settled narrative. Their message has been settled. It's not so much the science. Um, and, and keep track of that, that they're going to use the settled science to keep pushing the narrative. They're never going to say, oh, I guess we were wrong. Let's change our narrative. The narrative was decided a long time ago. Um, the issue is never really the issue, and, and this one is very, very important. There are some people behind some of these issues and these movements who are extremely sincere, totally believe in what they're doing, they think the problems are real, they really want to solve it. There really are people like that, but there are way, way, way too many other people 
They don't care at all about any of these issues. It's just an opportunity to use that to accomplish something else. And they're doing a lot of damage along the way, especially when they're trying to protect certain groups. They don't care about those groups. They're using them to, to benefit themselves personally. It's, it's just really sad. So realize that very often, whatever they're pushing, they don't really care about that. They're just trying to accomplish something else. Keep balance, don't go overboard regarding any particular issue. If you really feel led to research COVID or vaccines or climate change, that's, that's fine. But don't go overboard with it. Keep a balance and keep in mind that scripture is our ultimate authority. So when you're dealing with something and you hear something about the vaccines or climate change, and you're like, man, it's kind of confusing because I heard this one scientist and he's like one of the leading guys and everything he said made sense. But then I heard this other person who's just as impressive and they had the opposite message, and that sounded good too, and I have no idea. You tend to believe the one that you want to believe, the one that you like. They say, well, I believe them because they're an expert. Well, what about this expert? You know. So when you're in that position, what you do is you just turn to Scripture. Now, Scripture isn't going to give you a verse telling you about the, the vaccines that we have today. I'm not asking you to study Scripture to find out about a specific vaccine. What you do is you go to God's Word and you read it and you pray and say, God, I'm confused. I'm not sure what to do. And let God lead you into some action that is not based on this data or this scientist. It's based on how God is leading you to respond in whatever situation you're in. And lastly, bring the focus back to the gospel message. This is really important and really easy to do. The world is upside down, and everyone is panicking about something. They're dealing with all these stresses. So do two things. Get better at listening to them. What is it that's on their mind? Is it climate change? Is it inflation? Is it the border crisis? Is it you know, any number of things? Listen to them. And then ask follow-up questions. Like, you know, what's your biggest concern about that? Have you dealt with this? Do you know anyone who's gotten sick from COVID? Did anyone you know, die in your family or whatever? And, you know, what do you think would happen to you if you got it, or if you died? Like, what do you think happens to people when you die? Just get to those types of questions and then listen to them more. What do you think is going to happen to you when you die? Let them tell you what they think might happen to them when they die. What led you to that conclusion? Are you sure about that? Are you like, you know for sure, you're just hoping or whatever? Let them talk. And then you can say, you know what, I'm dealing with all these stresses too. You know, the inflation thing is killing me financially, and the COVID thing, my wife got sick, or whatever it is. But then you can share, but even throughout all that, I still have peace. And here's why. Here's how I actually have peace, even though everything's gone haywire. And then you share your testimony, share the gospel. That's what it's about. Um, not getting political here, but a few years ago, economically, we were doing a lot better, and people were a lot more upbeat and positive. Um, it's a little bit harder during those times to share the gospel sometimes. Like, no, no, I'm good. I'm fine. I don't, I don't need the Jesus thing. Today, people need the Jesus thing. <laughs> They're like, help, anything. What, I'll even listen to the Jesus thing, you know. Um, take advantage of that. People are desperate for hope because they don't know what the solution is. We have it. It's Jesus.